Uh, let's meet our trio of news reviewer. We're pleased to meet the reporter at Guido Fawkes, Tom Harwood. Welcome to the programme, Tom. Thank you. Uh, Guardian columnist Polly Toynbee is back. Hello. Hello, Polly. And the founder of Fat Less Preserves, Bridget Dean, is back. You may remember she wowed us and Mark with her marmalade. Hello, Bridget. Good morning. Welcome back. Thank you. you. Now, you're in Newcastle this morning? I am. Well, please go first. If everyone gives a headline and you can start us, Bridget. So, my headline is from the Mail on Sunday and it's PM race turning toxic already. Tom? It's uh, The Observer front page. Stop Boris Johnson. Tory moderates open battle to block no-deal Brexit. And Polly. Mine's the Sunday Times. Get Boris. Gove challenges his rival again. You've got the hint of what papers say about you there, Polly, with those voices. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let's go deeper now. Polly, let's start with you. Uh, Give us a story of your own uh, and review it for us. Find it, find it. Get get, get us going. Well, I think we should get going on on this whole question of the uh, extraordinary toxic nature, which is, you know, only on day one, practically. And off we go. I think the real drama will be the Boris versus Gove, partly because the Sunday Times... Times, Murdoch will be backing his man, Gove, and the, and the Telegraph Group will be backing their man, Boris. So it's going to be a battle of the press barons as well. Uh, quite fierce, quite risky, I think, speaking as a columnist myself, that we could be confronting the battle of columnists to be prime minister. It's one thing to write about things and to have fine opinions. It's quite another to actually make things happen. So the Sunday Times, which you're reading from, says, get Boris, Gove challenges his rival again. Do you think that Michael Gove will be the stop Boris candidate? Is that the sort of essence of that item? It looks that way. I mean, there'll be quite... There are so many hats in the rings. There'll be cartoons somewhere comparing it to the, the queue of people climbing up Everest. Is this is this the queue for Everest? No, it's the queue to be Prime Minister. To be Prime Minister. I think... Um, I think that in the end they will have to crystallise it around, uh, you know, on the leave side, Boris and Gove. But then, you know, there needs to be somebody who's a sane Remainer, like a Rory Stewart or an Amber Rudd. Tom Harwood, you're going to tell us about the Sunday Times as well. Hunt and Leadsom square up in the new Battle of the Brexiteers, page six. Absolutely. There's this marvellous double-page spread in the Times of just about everyone in the running to be the next Prime Minister and detailed profiles of the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, and the recently resigned uh, leader of the Commons, Andrea Leadsom. um, Hunt's pitching himself as sort of an entrepreneurial candidate, someone who's set up and, and run business is large and small and someone who wants to cut corporation tax down to Irish levels which will be very attractive for the Tory membership but there is that hurdle that he is a Remainer and it's unlikely that the Tory membership will go for him for that simple point and then there's this uh profile of, of Andrea Leadsom telling us a bit more about her backstory when she uh, went on a holiday to Greece as a teenager was robbed and had to work her way through that holiday in order to get enough money to get back which is quite interesting and it gives us more depth about a person who not much of the country knows that well. So you're recommending the Sunday Times for runners and riders? Absolutely. Um, now, Bridget Dean, you haven't selected politics, so you don't have to comment on it, but I'll tell you uh, in the Barry Cryer moment, the Matt cartoon says it has a picture of a man in a suit with his phone saying, yes, I'll be voting for you in the leadership contest. Who is this, by the way? And uh, what do you make of it all, Bridget? Do you think it's a bit crowded, the field? Um, yeah, I think it's basically just there's too many people in the run. It's basically, you know, it just feels like nobody's thought about why they've actually put themselves forward. It just seems like it's an opportunity to get their face in the public, really, without actually taking on board kind of the consequences and the exhaustion of the public surrounding all this. Uh, yep, I think we should be looking as well. Observer front page, Watson says back vote or lose election. That although the main news is always going to be the Conservatives because they're about to produce the Prime Minister. Extraordinary, isn't it? That 100,000 eccentric older people in the shires are going to choose our Prime Minister for 46 million voters. But nevertheless, Labour is also yeah. likely to be in some trouble when the results come out later tonight. It's a bit ironic that Tom Watson's sort of railing against this when that's exactly the position that his own party, the Labour Party, is in, uh, with an eccentric leader decided by an even more eccentric membership. Um, but I, I was reading another story. Yes, but he's in... not Prime Minister. What the, the danger with the Tories is they're actually producing our Prime Minister. 
Yes, it's a parliamentary democracy. This is what I mean. Uh, in in two thousand and seven, Gordon Brown took over without a even a vote of the membership. Yeah, I agree. Is, Shocking, and it yeah. did him no good either. Much better to have a clean general election. Okay, let's turn away. Thank you for raising all of these issues. Return to them if you want. But Bridget, I want you to tell us that one of your first picks. Tell the world something you want to from any news media this morning. Um, I think I've picked this this is about uh, mortgages basically that won't be paid off till we're 100 years old Uh, banks are raising the maximum years that you can get a contract for a mortgage from 35 to 40 which means a lot of people will be 100 years old before they pay their mortgage off so you're reading this from the Sunday Times. It's from the Sunday Times, yeah. And do you think that's realistic or is that just like a you know a way to the exception proves the rule? Well, I think it's realistic as long as there's not a housing slump um, because you're obvious, obviously people are relying on selling the houses before that to pay off those mortgages and probably to make a profit, but the reality might be different kind of in 30 years' time. Um, let's go back to you, Tom. At last, led by donkeys show their faces in The Observer. Yes, this was a funny piece um, for me to read because, of course, um, the, the headline here is no one knew that it was us, these people who've been running a sort of guerrilla Remain campaign, putting up billboards around the country. But uh, my website, Guido Fawkes, ran an expose on these people just last week. So I think The Observer is a little bit behind the times on this one. Um, these are four people who are involved with Greenpeace who have raised hundreds of thousands of pounds through online crowdfunding to put up uh, pro-Remain posters around the country. And there's an interesting question that comes off the back of this. Uh, They said on their... Uh, crowdfunding website that each poster costs a thousand pounds to put up they've put up 230 of these that means that they look like they've spent 230 thousand pounds when the spending limit for uh, non-party campaigners in european elections is about half that so they might have some interesting questions to answer well, um, if the electoral commission get investigating this it's interesting because when you say posters what they've done is they've gone back on the record to find comments from people in the public eye so So, for instance, Dominic Raab, I hadn't quite understood the full extent of this, but we are particularly reliant on the Dover-Calais crossing. Uh, Absolutely extraordinary quote. Should should rule him out altogether. I mean, the sheer ignorance of these people who promoted leave without ever explaining or knowing themselves what the difficulties would be left the country quite angry. Even people who voted leave saying they never told us it would be this difficult. But Tom, you were part of the campaign, weren't you, as a student? That's right. Yeah. So, your David Davis, who is one of your supporters, here's another of the led by donkeys posters. If a democracy cannot change its mind. It ceases to be a democracy. Well, that's perfectly true. But I think in normal democracies, once you vote on something, you implement it. And I don't think any lever in the country has a theoretical opposition to revisiting the issue down the line. But first, we need to implement the result of the first referendum. Uh, the second referendum, because the first referendum in 75... <laughs> well, if we're vote. going to include more votes, we had a referendum in 2016, a general election in 2017 where over 85% of uh, the votes went to parties supporting leaving, and now we've had a European election where lo- it looks likely the Brexit party will win for a third time. We'll wait to see about that, because what people will be counting tonight will be how many votes fall essentially on the Leave side and how many on the Remain side, and maybe we shall see... What's quite funny about that, just shift. quickly, um, I saw a poll... Uh, just just the day of the vote that showed exactly 52% of the votes oh. went to the Leave parties and 48 went to the Remain parties. Well, we shall see tonight, won't we? Uh, all of the polls, for, uh, for, for two years now, all the polls have shown uh, Remain ahead by about 8%. Okay, let, let's turn but to... But what I would like to add is that I also think there's going to be real harsh lessons learnt on both sides tonight from those results because I think voters are going out to kind of punish and spank those parties that have let them down on all sides. OK, and then I know that before we leave, Polly's going to tell us that David Cameron and George Osborne mm-hmm. might be back in the news. But let's turn away now, Bridget, just for a second. Happiness in the Sunday Express. How can we be the happiest we can be? Well, apparently you need to be a woman and you need to have no children. Um, so Are you as... ready for this, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I hear that's possible nowadays. But there is good news for Tom as well, because if he does get married, he will be happier and live longer, though or his wife may die before him and that's so it's not good for wa- for women to marry so as a woman who isn't married and doesn't have children I have to say I don't necessarily skip through the tulips every day um, but I am glad that I don't have to do school runs or spend my weekends in a car taking all my kids to dance or singing lessons Ah uh, well when you've got children you wouldn't be without them 
I agree. Uh huh. This is um, all a bit later in life for me. I'm not sure quite which way I'll decide. Um, what about the question of happiness? This is something that we're told uh, we're all seeking to put in a nutshell. Mindfulness comes up. Authenticity is a big search for at the moment, isn't it? And the candidates who, who seem most at ease with themselves are often the most popular in public life. Do you, do you think that uh, we, we need it more than ever, an answer to this conundrum, Polly? I, I think happiness is a big issue. And actually, there has been some attempt by the government to measure well-being but there's a lot of puzzlement as to what it's really measuring and different countries and different cultures may answer that question in different ways. Um, we seem to be a not very happy country at the moment. To you, Bridget, you, know, you spend a lot of time cooking. Mm-hmm. Do you think that living in the moment, waiting for something to boil, uh, you know, waiting for fermentation or whatever it is, do you think that's good for the human in a sort of very immediate society? I think I think it's very good, um, and there's times where I really benefit from that. But the reality is, I still run a business, so when you've got a huge order to get out, the mindfulness goes out the window, like everybody else at work, and it's just about kind of turning it over and getting it out there to the customers. Well, marmalade may be a problem, but I can tell you, when you're in the Westminster bubble with us us journalists and politicians at the moment mindfulness is out of the window it's mayhem not mindfulness <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and chaos and i think that one thing that um delivers more happiness is knowing what's going on knowing your own mind and having a bit of a purpose you're listening to the news review with polly toynbee bridget dean and tom harwood who's looking for or finding his purpose it could be both uh, but you can move us on tom you're going to tell us about the pizza club in the mail on sunday absolutely this is this club of brexit backing cabinet ministers who uh were meeting on that fateful wednesday when uh andrea Leadsom at the end of the day resigned well during prime minister's questions in that day the pizza club was meeting there were fraught discussions um people like andrea Leadsom, like liz truss were putting forward the view that the prime minister really has to go this is uh, a club that has been slow to move over um uh, because just in, in in last <laughs> Perhaps, perhaps. In in December, Dominic Raab resigned, but no one else followed. And it seemed like on Wednesday, things had shifted to that point where they'd just reached the point of no return. And to you, Polly, I promised you were going to tell us about George Osborne and David Cameron in the Mail on Sunday. Yes, amazing story. Look who's eyeing a comeback. Cameron considering a dramatic comeback. What do you think about this? And you think, well, people would quite like to have him back where we get our hands on him. He is the man who has brought us to this state, brought the country so low, so divided, so unhappy. So we'd quite like him to come back. But then if not him, why not Blair, Major and Brown? Uh, None of them are in the House of Lords. They could all come back in the Commons. It would be quite entertaining, I think. Theresa May staying in the Commons. He, in this article, he denies he's going to stand for Seven Oaks this, uh, when uh, Sir Michael Fallon steps down. I think that's the point. So, do you think that, should we read anything into it? Do we expect David Cameron to go back, Tom? I think it's highly unlikely. Um, the big rumours were that he was eyeing up a post at NATO or a large international organisation. I think that's more his bag than getting back into the nitty gritty of day to day Westminster politics. Osborne, though, nine jobs already. He's rumoured to be uh, seriously eyeing up coming back. Um, Well, people quite like to get their hands on him, too, with the austerity that is causing so much suffering. And uh, can I just say, I think if David Cameron's got any sense, he'll just stay in his shepherd hut. (laughs) (laughs) And we'll go with the metaphorical version, because, you know, people are worried about this, this, the physical metaphors about getting your hands on politicians, Polly. And I mean, I know that there's a lot of anger around there, but, you you know, if you could get him face to face, what would you ask him? You get one question as, with all your columnistic experience. You get David Cameron, you have one question to him. What would it be? Do you repent having put your party and the interests of your party, trying to hold your party together, ahead of the interests of the country which you have divided so mortally? Tom? When's your book going to come out? <laughs> it was announced um, just a couple of weeks ago that it would be coming out this summer, but now there's a leadership contest. Is it going to be delayed yet again? And what about you, Bridget? Do you have a question for David Cameron? I think it's more of a statement. Shame on you. <laughs> Good. Gosh. <laughs> That's, I, 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 think, I think David Cameron gets a bad rap, really. He was put in a position where I think any prime minister after those 2014 European elections, with the mood of the country moving the way it was, I'm not sure any prime minister could not have offered a referendum to the people. But he still has to take responsibility for the decision he made. 
That's true, and I think it was a massive mistake for the for there to be no planning beforehand. I think a responsible government should have planned for what would happen in the aftermath. And the danger is the same mistakes going to be make, made again. He did it because UKIP did so well. Now this time, lots of candidates will be chasing after Farage and trying to copy him. Not the right way to go. I think it's reasonable to say that he wouldn't have won a majority in 2015 if he didn't offer that referendum. OK, I get the disagreement and the passion. Thank you for coming on a Sunday. And the Today's producers were Tom Hill and Emma Pierce. The editor was Amanda Lewis.